Happy Sunday. I have my neuro coffee in hand and it is time for this week's Q&A. Oh man, that's good. Hey, did you see the video I just posted on uh, Instagram? Uh, Instagram TV? What I actually put in this uh, to make it taste so good and to make it so much better for you. Um, when, when Dr. Mike made neuro coffee and said that we had a coffee that was better for your brain, I started drinking coffee when I was 50. And then I've added some stuff to that to make it even better for my brain. So, so check that out. Also this past week on BillHartmanPT.com, I posted a new blog on how we explain things to clients. I hope it's useful for you, so please check that out. Um, on YouTube, we have last week's Q&A, and then I threw up a video about individualization of exercise programming. So I'm not a big fan of the whole generic, uh, this exercise is good for everything uh, kind of a concept, and so I, I speak a little bit about how to individualize or why we need to individualize. So, so check that. Also on Instagram, um, we'll talk about finding a solution for your pain. So again, another concept of in individualization for you. Um, the value of teaching to learn. So the Padawan is gone. We're, we're going to have another Padawan coming in in, in uh, January. Um, so I'm a big fan of teaching, but, it, but more importantly for the teacher is to understand that every time you teach something, you learn something. And so kind of a big deal. I think it's essential for us to, to become teachers, to become the best at what we do. Uh, there's also a segment from the uh, IFAST podcast uh, discussing the evolution of continuing education. So how you might want to look at this depending on where you are in your career and what type of continuing education you might want to seek out at this point. So that was of, of interest. And of course, we'll get the videos for the 16%. But now let's dig into this week's questions. So my first question comes from Andrew. And Andrew asks, could you explain what's going on with the pelvic floor when someone is doing a goblet squat in the rack with the band attached to the J-hook, so when they squat down, it's almost as if they're bouncing off of the band. I'm curious as to the intent behind it, when it's appropriate, and why. So Andrew, this is in reference to a video that Eric Huddleston posted. Um, I believe, I'm going to say it's EPH.24 is his handle on Instagram. So if you want to check that out. And so what this was, was a female athlete that Eric's been working with that had been doing a box squat variation to help her control the eccentric element of, of her pelvic diaphragm. And so, so when she initially came in, she was having uh, a bit of difficulty capturing the concentric orientation of the pelvic diaphragm and making the return up out of the squat. And so what Eric did brilliantly was actually started on a, a couple of box squat variations but now she's going to learn how to control that concentric orientation still yield so she can squat or so she can uh, execute a counter movement if you would in, in some form of jumping activity and so what she's doing now is she's squatting to the band so the band is actually just representing a target for her so she knows how deep she was and so the the target would be representative of where the box was and so now she squats to the band so she's now learning how to control and and execute concentric orientation with pelvic diaphragm but still capture the enough yielding to allow her to move and then she, she's able to uh, recapture that concentric orientation as she comes up out of the squat. So it's just a simple progression from the box squat, but now, like I said, it's just an element of control that she now needs to learn how to manage herself without the use of the box. And then eventually the band gets taken away as well, and then she progresses to more dynamic activities of, of higher rates of speed and then greater levels of challenge. So nothing magical, she's not bouncing off the band, she's just using that as a target. And like I said, it's just a transition from something that was a little bit more stable, a little bit more limiting like the box squat. So my next question comes from Drew. Drew wrote a really long question, so, so I may get through this. Uh, following my last question, so Drew, Drew is, is the guy that uses the word keen, so thanks again, Drew, for, for using that. Um, Following my last question, I've, I've treated myself to a safety bar, uh, squat bar, the spider version, as a wide ISA individual targeting hypertrophy and strength, but 
not at an unacceptable cost to my health and movement variability of a question regarding the squat pattern. With your help to date, my hingy squat is looking more squatty. Thank you. Uh, to date, I've been using light front squats, um, but when the safety squat bar arrives, I'm looking to increase my load on my squatty squat. My understanding is that targeting a squatty squat will help improve my movement variability by helping me become less exhale bias and compressed. But I also understand that improving force production may reinforce my compressed exhale biased axial skeleton. In light of this, using the safety squat bar, is there a limit to how much I should progress the loading of a safety squat? So thanks, Mr. Keen. Um, so Drew, this is a really, really good question, but but we're about to answer the ultimate question of how strong is strong enough. So yes, as you increase force production, you will have to increase your ability to compress. You will have to increase your ability to utilize an exhalation strategy because that is how we increase our ability to pr produce force against uh, loads or gravity or whatever it may be uh, in, in regards to dynamic activities. So you're going to have to determine what key performance indicators you're going to monitor to, to determine when your compressed exhalation strategy is becoming so predominant that you begin to lose something of importance to you. And so now if we're working with a regular client who is concerned primarily about health, we'll monitor some element of their mobility that would be indicative of when they start to lose that variability that we would associate with health. So, and we would do the same thing with an athlete if, if that athlete requires some movement capability to perform their sport. So that's how we know where that ceiling is. Drew, I can't answer that for you. You're going to have to determine what your key performance indicators are that are the most meaningful to you and then monitor those over time. There's not, there's not a black and white answer. A lot of people want black and white answers to these things and there just isn't one. Everything is about gray. Everything is about individualization. So if you have any questions about what are the most important K KPIs for you, then feel free to ask another question because I think, I think this is a really good, good uh, thread of questioning that a lot of people don't really understand. They just think that everything is good for everything or everything is bad for everything when we're playing a lot with gray areas here. So thanks, Drew, for that question. F figure out what your KPIs are and then we'll go from there. So Mihail has a pelvic diaphragm question and I'm assuming it's a heat. So Miguel says, does the ability to abduct the femur equal the pelvic diaphragm eccentrically orienting and the pelvic outlet closing and the ability to adduct the femur, the pelvic diaphragm concentrically orienting and pelvic diaphragm widening? Are these useful tests to figure out where someone is, uh, is limited in, in propulsion? So yeah, they are, they are useful, and I think your understanding is, is generally correct, but keep in mind that you're only using one representation. So, so whenever we look at, at anything that is externally rotation oriented or, or internally rotated oriented, we have to use a series of tests because as we move through uh, any joint range of motion, so we're talking about hip range of motion here, there are, there are different positions through the, the hip motion that are representative of external rotation and internal rotation. If we only use one representation, then um, it would be accurate for that position only. So for instance, if I take you into full hip flexion as another element of external rotation, that's the early propulsive phase. And so if I have a limitation there, then I know you'd be limited in early propulsion. Whereas with the hip extended, we're moving towards a later propulsive strategy. So again, you, you need to look at these measures across the, extent, the extended range of motion of, of that joint. So we can't just use a single representation, um, especially when we're talking about dynamic movement. So if we were looking at a squat, we would have to look at, at the performance through the entire excursion of the squat and identify what that hip is capable of doing to determine where there may be a limitation in the, in the propulsive strategy. So um, Mihail, I think that you're, you're on track, but, but keep in mind, again, you've got to look at, at a number of measures to determine whether you've got any limitation throughout the propulsive strategies. So I got a question from Brian and this is in regard to running. So Brian said, 
what is the typical underlying driver in an individual that presents with an excessive uh, femoral internal rotation in standing static posture and excessive bilateral leg whip when running? Is this typically an excessive anterior orientation of the entire pelvis versus sacral nutation with ileal ER? Well, let me address the last part of that. Um, sacral nutation, if we're talking about relative motions of the sacrum, in a case of sacral nutation, the ilium would be in, in uh, relative IR if the sacrum is notated. So I just wonder if that was a little typo uh, on your part. Um, typically, I'm going to say typically, uh, Brian, what you're going to be looking at is an anterior orientation of the entire pelvis. And so we get a, an orientation of the acetabulum that is, is facing a little bit more downward, and that's what allows a lot of that excessive IR to occur. Um, so what you may see then is, is an increase in, in what would be considered lordosis, um, which would, again would support this anterior orientation element um, as far as the driver of, of the internal rotation. Um, so we could have a compressive strategy on the, on the posterior aspect of, of the pelvis and the anterior orientation, or we could have the relative motion with an anterior orientation as well, and both will result in an increase in, in hip internal rotation. Um, one of the things that you want to monitor to determine whether you do have the anterior orientation is hip external rotation. So especially when I get the loss of hip external rotation, then you kind of know that you've got that anterior orientation going. So if I have excessive IR and a limitation in ER, we can pretty much point towards that anterior orientation being, being causal in regards to what you're seeing. So Brian asked a, a second question, and I think this might be actually leftovers from, from last week's Q&A, so Brian, I apologize for not getting to this sooner. But Brian says, what test do you use to determine if you have a, a compressive strategy? So, so let's kind of look at this um, broad scope first, because I, I talk about this a lot at the, the intensive in regards to the progressive uh, compensatory strategies, Brian, any concentric orientation results in compression. That's what it does. And so not every compression is a bad thing. It, it actually allows movement to occur in the, in the, the eccentrically oriented position. Um, so what we have to do, though, is determine whether we're getting uh, compression, compression locally, which is what we typically see with normal movement, or are we getting a superficial compression? So let's use the, the sternum as a representation of this. So if I have the sternal pec concentrically oriented, I get a down pump handle and I, I lose internal rotation. So again, these are all representative of some form of superficial compressive strategy. So if I lose dorsal rostral due to, uh, let's just say, lower middle trapezius compression, then I'm going to lose some element of, of external rotation. So again, each one of these compressive strategies is representative of a loss of range of motion somewhere, and it's rather specific once you understand where these compressive strategies are occurring. And so I, I don't want to get, get too deep into this because this is something that we spend a great deal of time on at, at the intensive. But, but again, you, I'm going to use the same test that everybody else uses. It's just going to be the representation of, of what we're seeing as the limitation that's going to determine whether we're seeing a, a normal uh, movement-based strategy or a superficial compressive strategy that truly restricts breathing and the ranges of motion. So my next question comes from Chase. And Chase asks, do you believe the entire human body is a literal tensegrity structure, or are there just some elements of tensegrity within the system? Uh, I read something interesting about how the spine can't be a literal tensegrity structure because the compression elements do not actually cross each other. Um, first, let me just say that, that tensegrity is probably the best representation of, of the human body and how it moves. Um, but I think that there's something that, that, that probably needs to be clarified um, based on the way that, that a lot of people perceive the human body in regards to its structure. So all of your, your stuff, if you will, all the connective tissues, including bone, are made of the, of the same stuff, primarily collagen. And so the collagen is going to behave a certain way. And I think that because bones appear to be stiffer than all of the other elements, that they tend to get pigeonholed into representing the compressive elements and then the muscles of course become the, the tension based elements and then on some of the softer connective tissues also represent some of these tension based elements but because of the biomechanics and behavior of, of these tissues 
um, at different times, different elements will represent the compressive elements and the tension elements. So, so bones compress and twist and elongate, just like all of the other tissues do. And so let me give you an example of where a muscle and tendon can be actually stiffer than a bone, and that would be in the case of an avulsion fracture. So under those circumstances, because of the seven components of force that were applied in, in some way, shape, or form at that moment in time to these tissues, the, the muscle and the tendon became stiffer than the bone, and so it rips the, a piece of the bone loose. So at that point, the, the bone is actually less stiff. So that would imply that, that the, the muscle and tendon at that point could have been um, a, a compressive element and then the tension element was represented by the bone. And so I don't think that we can, we can blindly say that these are the compressive elements and these are the tension elements because I think it matters um, what the context is and under those circumstances. So again, I think that the tensegrity is probably the best represent, representation that we do have because of the way that we are constructed, because of the forces that we are able to withstand. And it just stands to reason that this is how we would distribute the, these loads. Because if you think about the way that a lot of these loads are calculated um, through, through Euclidean geometry, they far exceed what we should be able to tolerate. And so the only way that we can tolerate a lot of these forces is to distribute the load throughout the entire system, which would be a tensegrity-based system. So um, do I think it's a literal tensegrity structure? Don't know, don't care. I just think it's the best model that we have right now. So my last question of the day comes from Mitchell. And Mitchell says that I'm very fascinated with pelvic mechanics at the moment, and I was hoping that you could offer some good resources to learn from. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, there are many. Um, there are as many as you would want to find. And all you have to do, Mitchell, is search PubMed or Google Scholar and put in some, some effective keywords, and you're going to get a lot of information. As far as, as books that are available, um, I would direct you towards... Uh, Schomburger's malalignment syndrome has a lot of uh, pelvic mechanics in it, but I would also ask that you read that book very critically because some of his interpretations are really open for discussion because of the way that he evaluates the system through uh, motion palpation tests. Um, at least that's what I perceive that he's doing. I think that some of his interpretations um, again, are either incorrect or, like I said, open for discussion. Uh, Movement Stability and Lumbopelvic Pain is a great book. It's a very broad spectrum. Got a lot of pelvic mechanics in that. Uh, Diane Lee's pelvis book has a lot of great pelvic mechanics. In, and I think it's in the first half of the book where you're going to get a, a fair amount of that. Um, let's see. There are a lot of papers involved. Don Tigney has a, a lot of uh, papers. But if you search on things like sacroiliac joint mechanics, um, uh, the, the pubic symphysis, um, pelvic floor, acetabulum orientation, or just type in human pelvis into Google, you're going to get plenty of information. But I would say that, that try to stick to some of the more peer-reviewed and professional resources, at least in the beginning to uh, establish your ability to filter that information and determine what is going to be useful for you and what is not. So thank you for those questions. So that pretty much wraps up the Q&A for this week. It's a short one. It's a weird week um, with that holiday stuck in the middle. we got another holiday coming up. So, so hopefully this week won't get too weird, but keep the questions coming. Ask Bill Hartman at gmail.com. Ask Bill Hartman at gmail.com. Send me your questions. Look for me on Instagram, and we'll see you next week.